I have, well, I don't know, some of you may interpret this as bad news, some may interpret this as good news. So my intention was that this course would be letter graded for one credit hour. Apparently it was set up to be sat unsat. The, we can have it switched, but apparently that means everybody will have to drop the class and then re-enroll. Now you guys don't care about as much of that because like for you that's one piece of paper per person, but for me that's like 90 pieces of paper. So how many people are like deeply concerned by this? How many people would really, I mean, the letter grading is going to be generous, I'm not gonna lie about that, but how many people are like really would like a letter grade in this class? It's okay, you can be honest with me. Just raise your hands actually so I can see them. Uh, okay. I don't know if that's quorum. How many people don't care one way or another? Okay, the, the don't cares are more confident, which I understand, so. All right, well that was sort of inconclusive, but I'll think about it. All right. So, what we're gonna talk about today is probably one of my favorite things about, about Kotlin as a language. Um, it's a, it's a and, I, and I'm not even sure if I know exactly how to describe it, but I mean, we're gonna try today, obviously, but this is a, programming style um, that I first encountered uh, when I was writing JavaScript 10 years ago that I really started to enjoy using and I was very happy to see Kotlin provide really nice support for this. So this is something that I'm referring to as map reduce filter, right? Um, named after some of the more common operations as part of this. But really what this is about is building programmatic data processing pipelines that leverage some of the features of the language that we've already seen. So we're going to take some things that we saw last time. So by the way, if you guys have questions about stuff that we covered on Wednesday, please ask them and we can come back to it later. But we're going to leverage that, right? We're going to leverage the functional nature of Kotlin, right? It's support for first class functions and anonymous functions to build these pipelines. We're going to leverage uh, the trailing Lambda syntax to make these data processing pipelines look really, really nice. We're also going to leverage the implicit it right, to avoid having to name parameters in certain cases, particularly when we're doing things that are simple, right? All right, so the, how many, how many people have heard of MapReduce before? I've heard that term. Okay, so I just want to distinguish, so MapReduce is not really what we're talking about here, right? Um, I, since it's Friday, I hope the guys will indulge me here. So has anyone here ever seen a, a video by James Mickens before? Okay. All right. Well, you guys are about to have like a a seminal experience in your life. Um, this is my friend James Mickens. Um, James is a tenured faculty member at Harvard. Uh, he does really uh, exciting and interesting research into computer systems. He's also very funny. Uh, he, for a period of time, I think he's still doing this, went around and gave talks at conferences about uh, technology that were sort of humorous in nature. This one is humorous in nature. I'd be happy to send out the link later if you guys want, but it's quite easy to find. Um, so I'll just play this brief, brief video clip. Um, but, all right. Things work out better with the new messages. It usually doesn't, but oh well. So I first heard about uh, distributed systems in 2004 when I was a grad student. And this is when I read that original uh, map or newspaper coming out of Google. Now, for a lot of people, reading that paper was like receiving knowledge from an alien race whose intelligence vastly surpassed our own, right? But the thing about MapReduce was that at its core, MapReduce was so simple. That paper that they wrote basically seduced you with its architecture for distributed computation. It was almost like Antonio Banderas came up to you and said, all you need to do is specify a mapping function and a reducing function and didn't know. You are done. Your computation is ready to run on thousands of commodity machines. And I would love you to see in my Antonio Banderas home. So that was like very exciting uh, like 10 years ago. But so now it's 2014. So I propose uh, let's just stop talking about MapReduce and the dupe and that entire software stack. It's not bad. I just don't want to hear about it anymore. It's like, I get it, you got a mapper, you got a reducer, you got a bunch of documents with words in them, and you want to use the mapper and reducer to perform word counts over all the documents. <laughs> Say word count one. <laughs> Again, I don't get it. I am so tired of hearing that word count example. 
Like, is that how we're going to convince young people that cloud computing is the future? It's like, hey, Timmy, hey, Sally, you know, you know what you can do with the whole warehouse full of machines? You can use them to count words. <laughs> That's the lamest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Okay? I could fill that warehouse with sweatshop kids and count those words for pennies a day. Okay? The index is inverted yet? No cookies for me. That's called entrepreneurship, y'all. You need to write that stuff down. All right. Anyway, you guys can go watch the rest. That's really funny. But there's a lot of like humor that you may not get. I've tried to show my wife these, and she just a lot of it's lost on her. But um, but anyway, but the, the, this is not what we're talking about. However, I do want to point out that this idea of using MapReduce as, as computational primitives, um, the way this was introduced to Google was in a way that allowed Google to make use of large numbers of commodity machines. So Google had these really big data processing tasks that they needed to perform. And part of what they wanted to do is they said, okay, let's come up with a couple of very simple operators that we can use that naturally scale, allow us to build a distributed system that scales a computation, like for example, right, producing an index of all the documents on the web. Let's find a, a principled way of building these types of computations that allows it to be run on many, many, many machines, right? So it's worth pointing out that this, this uh, paradigm of working with data is quite general, right? I mean, essentially, at a particular point, and again, this is now 20 years out of date, right? But at a particular point, a lot of the data processing that Google was doing was able to fit into this paradigm of combining these two operations together, right, in these interesting ways, right? So what we're talking about is just doing that as part of a single computer program, right? Not in a way that's going to span an entire data center, right? But the building blocks of this style of and, and, you know, as you guys will start to see, um, this is also a style that really eschews some of the common programming constructs that you guys have learned to use in some of our courses. So, for example, uh, as we go forward in this class, um, you're not going to see a lot of loops, right? Because we're going to stop using them in favor of using some of these MapReduce style um, computations. All right, so, so what are we talking about, right? So there are three... And maybe there's really just two, right? Maybe it's just really MapReduce. I think filter is useful enough that it belongs in this list, but I'm so, I sort of made this up. So the two big ones are, are map and reduce. These are, in the, in the terminology that we talked about Friday, these are higher order functions. Map and reduce are functions that take a function as an argument. Um, they operate on a collection. So these are ways of working with data. By data, we mean multiple things, right? We've got a you know, data. This could be, uh, there's ways to run maps over a map. So going forward, it's also useful to um, distinguish between map as a verb, which is what we're talking about, and map as a noun, which is the data structure that maps keys to values. Map as a verb is a way of transforming each item in a collection in some way. So a mapper takes a function that receives each item in the collection one at a time and, is, and replaces it with some other value. Okay. We'll go through all these in more detail, right? This is just the overview. Reduce, on the other hand, takes all the values and somehow reduces them down to a single result. So reduce takes a whole collection and then reduces it into a single result. Sometimes that can be something like performing a sum where the result is like one value, and sometimes we reduce into a different kind of collection, right? So that's another way to do it. And then filter is a way of removing some of the values from consideration. So when I filter a collection, I'm saying there are certain values I don't care about or I'm not interested in, right? Um, how many people have ever written a SQL query before, right? So you might see some analogs. Really, all your hands should be up, but you, you guys will get there, right? Uh, SQL's not my favorite thing to use, but it is very common. Um, the, you'll see echoes in terms of database syntax here, right? So like filter. Filter is the equivalent of a SQL where clause, right? It allows us to specify that we're only interested in certain pieces of data from this collection, right? You, and these operations can be chained together, right, to build arbitrarily sort of powerful and uh, interesting processing pipelines. All right, so to see, you know, to see the difference between these two styles, right, this is what we've taught you to do. This is what I'm teaching students to do in 125 right now, right? You know, let's say I want to uh, do this sum, and just to make this interesting, I said, you know, the first eight powers of two, I think this came up in, in one of our earlier classes. So here's how, you know, we've taught you to do this. 125, 126, 225, whatever. I mean, this, is, this is what we teach. 
You know, I've got a, you know, an accumulator variable there called sum. I have to mark that as a var. Not happy about that. I've got a loop. I don't like loops anymore. Um, and then, you know, I'm just adding things to it one at a time, right? Um, so that's great, okay? Um, now, again, there's some things about this that when you start to think in more Kotlin idioms, we don't like. So we, I don't like, for example, that uh, var is mutable. And I'm not really super happy about this loop that I've stuck in there. Um, all right. So here's how to do this using MapReduce. And really, MapReduce filter, there's no filter here, but it's just a map, mapper and a reducer. Okay? So let me put them both on the same, same screen. Right? I mean, these do exactly the same thing. Um, but you can see syntactically there's, there's huge, a big difference here. Right? And so let's, wa let's walk through this. Again, we're going go, to see a lot of these examples today. Right? So the first thing to note is, you know, and, and one of the things that's really nice about Kotlin, actually, that I'm really starting to appreciate, is that a lot of the things that you see in Kotlin lo that look like they're built into the language aren't. They're actually legitimate first-class citizens in the language. So for example, this until operator, we haven't talked about this yet, but Kotlin has the notion of what's called an infix function. It's a function that can appear in between its arguments rather than when its arguments on one side of it. So this is an actual function in Kotlin. Right? We I could actually show you how to build that if you want later. But let's focus on our uh, on these. These are functions. You know, they're not. This is not magic. It's not like built in to the language. Right? This is just a function. In, in fact, if we have time later in class, we'll implement our own version of map. Right? It'll be a little more limited than Kotlin's map because we haven't talked about generics yet. But we can do it. Map is a function that takes a function as an argument, right? That function is what follows here within the braces. This exploits that trailing lambda syntax that we saw last time, where because the last argument and the only argument to map is a, um, is a function, I don't have to enclose it in parentheses. So I can just allow it to trail map. What else do we see in here from last time? Another piece of sort of syntactic simplification that occurs in this example. Yeah. Yeah, it, right? The implicit it. So the function that I pass to map receives a single argument. That argument is set to each element in the collection one at a time as the mapping is performed. I could call it something, but I've decided to just use the implicit it. So you'll see it, it appears here. Right, because I'm taking two, I'm raising it to the power of it, and then converting it to an int. I hate that this is here. I wish that Kotlin had an integer exponentiation operator, but it doesn't. It's a double exponentiation operator, so that's a little bit of grossness, but too bad. All right. So this this mapping function is taking each item in this or this original collection, which is the number zero through eight, non inclusive, or zero through seven, and it's mapping it. So now I have a new collection that consists of the first eight powers of two, starting with zero. Now I've got this reducer, and reduce is probably, you know, map and filter, I think you guys are going to pick up pretty quickly. Reduce is the one that's tricky, but also super powerful, right? It's probably the most powerful of the three, right? Even, I would say filter is really useful, very simple. Um, map is, is quite useful, very simple. Reduce is incredibly powerful, a little trickier to wrap your mind around. So this reducer is receiving something that I'm calling sum and then an element. The element is each value in the collection one at a time. And what it's doing is it's producing a new value which is then passed to the next iteration of reduce. The first time I call reduce, it operates on the first two items in the collection and it produces a new result. The next time that result is passed as the sum to the next call to reduce. And so how do I, produ how do I actually produce a sum of a bunch of numbers? Well, I start by adding the first two, and then I add one by one. I just add it into that, right, and pass the result on, right? So this is what my reducer is doing. So again, these two um, operations perform the exact same computation, right? What's, n well, you know, what's nicer about doing it this way? Um, first of all, I think that there's a, you know, I think there's this syntactically is much more elegant. Uh, it's also easier to modify. So let's say we only want to, 
include, for some reason, values that are smaller than eight. I can do that very easily by just adding this one step to the pipeline. I didn't change anything else, right? You know, that was, that was extremely easy to do, whereas it would be uglier, right, if I had to add this to my for loop. One of the nicest things about this particular style of programming is that it really, you, you try to highlight the logic, the things that are actually doing the work, right? So rather than, you know, being distracted by the loops and the collections, I might, temporary collections I might have to set up, this really allows us to, to focus in on what's doing the work, right? The mapping function, what's happening inside the map, right? What's happening inside the reduce, right? Um, here, I don't even have to declare a variable name because I can use it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I could have I could have named it something else. Yeah, sorry. Um, let me call this something else. That you're right. This, that's a confusing. It's it's a local variable. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I should I'll change the example. And so again, you know, you know, I, I just want to highlight how we see the high order, uh, high order functions map and reduce. We see the trailing lambda. We see the implicit if, right? So a lot of the things we talked about last time, we're going to utilize today as, as we figure out how to use this to work with data. The other nice thing is that Kotlin's type inference also makes this really, uh, really nice, right? Um, in the sense that Kotlin knows. What the, so Kotlin knows, for example, that the input to map is a collection of integers. The result of the map is another collection of integers. It doesn't have to be. The result of the map could be strings, right? Um, and then it knows that the input to reduce is a series of strings. And so it can make sure that the operations that I'm uh, performing on these are safe, right? Um, and we'll see some examples later of places where this, where this goes wrong, right? But you also don't see any types here. Right. I've got zero type clutter in this example, which is actually really, really cool. All right. So, yeah, okay. So, you know, again, I'll... I'll and the other thing you're going to find in Kotlin that I think you're going to really like about it is that a lot of this stuff is just built right in. So it's actually pretty useful to know how to do sum using reduce. I can't imagine that that would never come up on an interview, um, but it's also built in. Like, come on, we don't have to write this anymore. So there's a bunch of like really useful collection operators that utilize that 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 operate as higher order functions that exist in Kotlin that you can use, right? Sum is one of them, right? So don't you know, don't write don't write your own sum reducer. It's useful to know how to do it. But all right, so now let's look at these one at a time. So so map transforms every item in a collection. And what I put inside my mapping function is totally up to me. The only, re the only requirement is that it has to yield a value. Right? So this is not filter. Filter is allowed to take stuff out of the collection. Uh, reduce is really actually boiling things down to a single result. Map is not. Right? Map is best for straightforward transformations of data. Um, this is particularly useful once we start to think about working with data that has more structure to it. Right? Like, for example, a list of people. Um, this is a very common use of, of map, right? In the sense that I have some objects, right? These are data classes, instance of a data class. And I want to extract one of their properties. And then I'm going to do something el else with it, right? Okay? So, so here I'm essentially just uh, printing the ages of everybody in my collection. One important thing to note about these is that they don't modify the collection. They're producing a new collection. And again, this, this is a, goes along with Kotlin's focus on immutability. So here, what's happening here? So I create my original collection. I'm using the list of operator. I map it into a new collection that just contains the ages. right? Um, but if I actually go back and print my original collection, it's unaltered. So the map mapping functions don't destroy the collection. They don't modify the collection. They produce a new collection. Again, these are, these are paradigms that are borrowed from functional languages, uh, which usually discourage mutating state whenever possible. Right. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, and, and this is nice because if I'm working, particularly if I'm working with data and I have some data frequently, I want to be able to extract information about it and, and not modify it. 
right? Particularly when I'm doing data processing or data analysis, right? There are times when you're doing data analysis where you actually do need to write back to the original data set because you're fixing something, you're adding a field that you want other people to use. But a lot of times when you're writing data analysis pipelines, the goal is to produce some output without modifying the data, right? And so MAP is, is well suited for this. MAP is a higher order function that, res that takes um, the mapping function. So this, this terminology gets a little bit um, confusing here, so I just want I, I, I to make sure it's clear. MAP is a function, it's a higher order function. The mapping function is the argument to the map, right? So again, MAP is a function that is built into Kotlin that exists on the collection object, right? But again, we can write this in a minute, right? There's nothing magical to it. Um, the mapping function is the function that's passed to map that performs the transformation. Right? It receives as an argument every item in the collection. If I don't provide that argument with the name, I get it, which is usually fine. There are cases where your code is more clear if you name it. Right? So here I'm going through all the people, and you can imagine if I had a longer block of code here, I might want to make it clear in that that this refers to a person. Right? I'm doing some stuff with the person's age. Right? All right. Um, you know, this is a good chance for us to review some of the uh, the features of anonymous functions in Kotlin. Um, so you don't return, you don't use an unqualified return out of a mapping function that doesn't do what you want. Um, in fact, I don't think it's even allowed, right? Um, frequently, with a simple map, what you see is that all I do, uh, an anonymous function by default will return or yield the last statement in it. So this will yield the age of each person. Let me see if I can actually use a return statement um, inside my... Yeah, no, no, no. So that's, that, that's not going to be okay, right? So it's not going to let me actually return out of, um, out of person age. And actually, well, you know what? Hold on. I think the reason is, this is the reason. Now this is going to... Oh, yeah, see? Yeah, so that's fine, okay. So the problem there was I was returning from main, I was returning an int, right? But again, this is not what I want, right? So here's what's gonna happen. When I run the map, main is now gonna return the age of the first person, which is not what I wanted to happen, right? I never got to this println because I hit this return statement in my map and I exited from the, from the main function. Um, if I want to exit the mapping function, I can use, again, this idea of a qualified return. Here, I don't use that, have to use a label. I can use this at map syntax that tells Kotlin which function I actually want to return from. Right? So this will return out of my mapping function. But normally, uh, particularly with simple maps like this, you don't even need to use return at all. It's just so much cleaner just to use this syntax. There are times when you're doing a more complicated map, you have a longer block there, and you actually do want to find yourself in a place where return is going to make the code quite a bit cleaner, and you can use the qualified return there. So up until this point, we've been talking about, we've really been working with map on lists, but I can apply a map to a map. Um, oh, another thing about maps when I use them on lists, it preserves the order. So the output collection is built one item at a time from the input collection in the same order. So, you know, whatever order my original items in are in, the mapping function you can... Now, this doesn't actually have to be done this way, right? Um, in the sense that my mapper could run backwards, it could run forwards, um, but the result is in the same order. Since, you know, we, we sort of uh, got here th from a brief digression into distributed systems, what, what about this particular style uh, would potentially make it easy to distribute across a large data center? Let's say I have like 10,000 machines and I have a huge data set, like billions, trillions of records, right? Why, in contrast with some of the other things like the loops and stuff like that, what about map? Um, what about this style do I like? So your mental model when thinking about map can be each item in the collection is processed one at a time like a loop. I go through from front to back. But do I have to do that? 
The mapping function receives an item in the collection. Right? Doesn't necessarily know anything else about the state of the world. So what, what could I do with this? Let's say that my mapper, instead of multiplying these ints by two, is taking a web document and, you know, returning, <laughs> well, counting words, right? Uh, returning an index of all the search terms that appear in that document. What can I do with that mapping function? <coughs> and why is this style of programming lend itself to this? Yeah. You can, like, parallelize this because the operations are independent. Yeah, these operations are independent. So I can essentially take, let's say I have lots of items I need to process, and I know how to process each one. So I'm telling the mapping function, here's what to do with every item to produce this new collection. I could potentially distribute that over thousands of machines. I tell each machine, here's what to do with the document, right? And then I send it the document, and it sends me back the results. As long as the mapping function doesn't need any more information, and if you use a framework like MapReduce, you're required to not be have to use any other information. Uh, then this is good for tasks that we sometimes refer to as being sort of embarrassingly parallelizable, right? Um, so, so again, you can think about map as going one item at a time, or if you want to, you can think that in parallel, map transformed every item in this collection into a new item. It knew where the new item went in the new collection and how large it was, but there's no need for us to think that this goes from front to back, right? Okay, good. So when we're using maps, we can also map a map. Um, and we can use maps to either transform the values in a map or the keys. You know, both of these are collections, right? Like the keys in a map constitute a collection, it's a collection of items. The values in a map constitute a collection. Neither one of these uh, functions changes the relationship between a key and a value, it just changes the values, right? So let's see how these, how these actually look. Um, so here, I started off with the map, 1 to 1, 2 to 2. I added 1 to every value using my mapping function to print that map. And then I transformed the keys. Right? So again, this style of working with data is not something that's just confined to lists. You can also use it on maps and other things. Oh, and sorry. There were, uh, there's two, two other sort of preliminary things I wanted to go over that I added over here. Okay. I think we already talked about this. We have already talked about string interpolation in Kotlin, so we've done this. The other thing I want to uh, show you is this thing, and this is another, this, this is one of the things that just doesn't really belong anywhere, so I kind of threw it here. Um, this is something called destructuring assignment. So the idea with the destructuring assignment this is that if I have um, an object that has certain properties, Rather than saying object dot key or object dot value, I can strip off those two properties into local variables using this syntax. So it's probably easier to let me let me try this. Let's see. L entry let's see, go to map dot entries dot first. So this is the first entry in the map. I'll print that. Okay. Now this entry has a key property. And it has a value property. And if I was working with this map, and I wanted to do, you know, down here, if I wanted to print the key and the value, I could do this. I could do entry dot key, and I could do entry dot value, and this is fine. It works, um, but this sort of syntax can get can get old fast. Right, in the sense that I have to keep constantly referring to this, uh, the parent of the parent object. And so line five strips off these two properties and saves them in local variables that I can then use in my code. Right? This is just a nice way of, I could, you know, this is equivalent to val key is equal to entry dot key. Let me put entry down here. Val values equal to entry dot value, right? And if uh, you guys probably have written code like this, where it's like I got tired of typing entry everywhere, so I just saved off the properties uh, so that I can refer to them more naturally. Um, but this code on line seven accomplishes the same thing. It says essentially, give me the key 
property from entry and the value property from entry and save them into these variables. And I can use this for any number of the properties on this. I could save one, I could save both. If all I wanted was the key, I could do this. That works fine. Now I can refer to it as just key rather than entry.key. Does this make sense? Does anyone use, does Python have anything like this? Okay, good. I know, I know JavaScript, though, so that's, that, that's happy. Okay. This is, okay, so this is pretty common. All right, so th the reason I wanted to introduce this is I want to use it here because otherwise this gets, gets kind of gross. So, um, and you know, if I, if I wanted to just work with the values or keys, what's passed to my mapper here is an entry. An entry in the map has a key property and a value property it represents one of the relationships in the map, right? Um, if I wanted just, so I could do this, here I'm returning it.value or I can just strip the value off and return value. To it's the same same thing, except the, the second one is a little, little nicer. Okay, questions at this point before we go go on and talk about reduce. All right, so redu I think reduce is the most difficult one of these to understand from a conceptual perspective. Map is easy. It's just like each element, I just replace it with something else. What reduce is doing is reduce is going through the entire collection and reducing it down to a single value in some way. Right? And part of this is because it turns out that I can't do everything I want to do in a map. Right? Map isn't sufficient. So if I want to compute a sum, for example, using a map, I can do something like this. So here I'm sort of just using map to kind of like emulate a for loop, but I've still got my variable outside the sum, which I don't want. Okay? So what I really want, so again, this requires mutable state. It's got you know, a variable outside our processing pipeline. Um, and also, I'm mapping this collection. So this is kind of interesting, right? So um, what do you think the result of the map is? So I have this list 1, 2, 5, and I call map. The map can refer to sum, right? Remember, this is um, how we use, this is one of the properties of anonymous functions in Kotlin. They receive a closure that contains the variables that were available when they were created. So map can access sum, okay? Typically we don't want to do stuff like this, but you can. It's kind of like, not, not, really, not really the right way to do it, but there's no way to avoid it. It's just one of the things the column will do for you. So I can do this, but what's the result of the map? Right, because I'm still replacing every item in the collection, right? So this is gonna, I'm gonna get something into my map. Anybody want to guess? So sum is going to be correct. Sum is going to be 8. But what's the map going to be? Let's try it. Oh. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. so, so this is actually particularly unhelpful. What, why did I get this value? Anybody want to take a guess? Because my map didn't yield anything. All right, so a, a plus operator. Let's, let's put the sum in here. Now you'll see. So now what I'm getting is a partial sum. So I get the sum up to that point in the list. So after one element, my sum is one. After two, it's three. After three elements, it's eight. That's not that helpful. So what I would like is you know, a higher order function that allows me to operate um, on, to, to, there, there's a variety of, you know, to complement map, right? So again, using map and reduce, I can build a whole uh, general purpose data processing pipeline. And so to complement map, I need a way to combine things together. So think about, again, think about Google, right? I've got lots and lots and lots of web documents. I send them out to hundreds of thousands of machines to process. Each one of those machines does the processing independently. So it takes one page on the web and it extracts data from it. But then to build a search index, I need a way to combine all that stuff together, right? Into one data structure that's used whenever you type a query. And so the general purpose approach to doing this is to use something called reduce, okay? Um, and, and, you know, again, reduce is just a little tricky to, to get a hang of. So let's try to make this a little bit, let's, let's use some examples to try to make this clear. So reduce receives two arguments. The second argument is a value in the collection. The first argument is the result of the previous call to reduce. 
Okay. So you might wonder what happens the first time reduce is called. We'll look at that in a sec, but let's just look at this on, let's see what happens if we run it and print what's happening, okay? So I'm gonna call reduce here on this, my collection which contains 10 numbers. And then each time I'm printing the values, so you see it receives, well, this is interesting. So it receives the values one through nine. What value does it not receive? Zero, okay. So the first time receive is called, it receives two values from the collection. The initial value is the first item in the collection and then the second item. After that, it receives the next item and the result from the previous call to reduce. Now here, every time I call reduce, I'm returning zero. So the result is never changing. But you can see how I get every item in the collection in order. Another way to think about it is, Reduce initializes the, um, the result to the first item in the collection and then starts with the next item, right? So result is initialized to whatever the first item in the collection is, and then I start reducing on the second item. So here I initialize reduce to zero, which was my first item, and then I start calling it on the rest of these, right, one by one. So this reduce is not particularly exciting, but let's look at how we can use it to do our sum. So now again, at every step in my reduce, I'm receiving two values, the result of the previous computation and a new value to incorporate. The way that I incorporate my new value is by adding it to the previous result. That's how I do a rolling sum. And I'm gonna print out the values as they go. The final result of the reduce is the value that results once I add the last element, right? So again, the first time reduce is called, so reduce initializes result to the first item in the collection, which is zero. And then it says, okay, show me how to combine the result with the next value, which is one. And I say, well, I add them together, now I get one. That's passed to two. That's, and so that's passed to the next call to reduce. The next item in the collection is two, right? I add those two together and I pass that to the next call to reduce, which receives three, right? Add those together, I pass it to six and I keep going and finally, the sum that results is 45. Any questions about this? Again, this is a little subtle. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We're we're about to get there. So 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 the the observation, which is a great one, right, is. The first time result is called. So remember, Kotlin's got types, but they're hiding, right? So the question is, how does Kotlin know the type of result and value? It's actually a great question. So how does Kotlin know the type of value? How is Kotlin inferring that type? I don't have to provide it. How does it know? Yeah? It knows from this range that I provided, right? That range operator 0 0.9 is ints, right? That's an int range. So it knows that reduces receiving values that are ints. How does it know the type of result? Well, but that's, but I don't know what the operation is yet, right? So, what's that? Yeah. Good question. So, again, a, a good way to think about it is reduce initializes result to the first item in the collection. Therefore, the type of result is the same type as the collection, right? So one of the limitations of reduce, which we just identified, is that the result has to be the same type as the collection, okay? So here, result, uh, here I'm summing things, so that's not a limitation. But again, let's say I wanted to like convert all these numbers to strings and append them all together. How would I do that, right? I need to start with something that's a string. So it turns out, happily, there's another version of reduce. Well, here's an example using product, okay? Um, oh, wait, hold on. Let me, well, let's just, let's just do a couple. So what do you think happens if you call reduce on a collection with a single element? So remember, reduce initializes the result of the first item in the collection, and then it repeatedly combines things from the collection into that to reveal the final result. 
So if they're, so I initialize the result of the first item, and then I have no other work to do. What do I get out of it? Just the first item. Yeah. So that works fine, right? So here you can see if I do the sum of the numbers zero until one until two, that's just one number. I get one. This is like ten, and this is and this is correct, right? Why these are good. Okay, but what about an empty list? Ah. So now this is interesting. What if I try to do this? So the first thing I want to point out is I had to put a type parameter on this list because I'm not initializing it with, it with any literals anymore, so Kotlin can't infer what type it is, right? Um, so it doesn't know whether or not the type that I'm passing to reduce is something that I can actually use with a plus operator. Any guesses? What happens if I try to run this? Yeah. They'll freak out. I like that. Very scientific answer. Um, yeah, basically. Unsupported exception, empty, empty collection can't be reduced. Right? So the reduce is, is, is not defined on an empty collection. Result is initialized to the first item in the collection. If the collection is empty, I don't even I don't have a starting point. That kind of makes sense. Right? Um, plus, if the collection is empty, I don't need to reduce it. Right? It's already reduced. All right, so now again, as someone pointed out, because reduce initializes the result to, um, or the other way to think about it is the first call to reduce is it's like it operates on the first pair of items. But I think a good, w I think a better way, which I'll go back and fix this, the write-up is that it initializes the result to the first item in the collection. It starts with the second item. But that means that both the result has to be the same type as the collection. And so again, if I wanted to do something like this, right, uh, here what I'm trying to do is actually concatenate as strings all the values in my list. Um, Basically, this is not going to work, right? Um, one of the, you know, just just um, just to prepare you for the rest of the semester, because now that, in, and again, if Max was here, he would have told me to do this a while ago. Um, one of the things that you're going to find different about Kotlin from Python, where there are basically no compiler errors, I guess. I guess there's type support now, but I don't know how it works. Um, and certainly from Java, is that the compiler errors in, P in Kotlin are frequently the results of failures of the type inference system that are not necessarily possible to correct, right? And those errors are a little different than the ones that you've been used to working with, right? So I just want to warn you that you may find these a little bewildering, right? So essentially, um, what, what is this trying to tell me? Right? You know, again, like it's sort of strange. Like this is not a compiler error I would normally get. Um, this this almost looks more like a template failure in C++ or something like that. Right? So plus, interestingly enough, is a function in Kotlin. Um, it's defined as an operator because it you know it, it, ap it can appear between two values, um, and essentially the idea here is that I can. There's, I can add different types of things together, but what can I not add together? Why, why won't this work? I can add two ints. I can add a long and a long. I can add a short and an int. I can add doubles to doubles and floats to floats. Why can't I add, in this case, result to value? What do I want result to be? I want it to be a, what am I hoping to get out of this reduce? I wanted a string, right? But what does Kotlin think the type of result is? It's an int. So the right, time of the, the right side of this plus is clearly a string. This is string in my using string interpolation to get a string. I could call value.toString, but I actually think this is a little cleaner. The left side of this expression is an int because result is always the same type as the type of the collection. And so Kotlin is basically saying, look, result's an int, value's a string, I don't know how to, how to put these together like this. Right? Um, now, if it, even if I could get this to work, the problem is that the result is going to be a string, and then Kotlin's going to freak out again. Because it's going to say, result, you return something from your reducer that's not the same type of resu uh, as result. Okay. All right, so 
the right way to work around this is to use a variant of reduce. And maybe I should have taught this first instead of reduce, because on some level I think it's a little simpler to think about. It's something called fold. So again, like if you if you've done any Haskell programming, if you've worked with functional languages, fold is like a very, very common way to think about working with with, with collections. So what is fold? So fold acts a lot like reduce, except that you provide the first value. Right? So fold takes an argument. You'll see fold is a higher order function, but it takes both an initial argument and then the folding function, which is provided in here using a trailing lambda. Now, because fold takes an initial argument, you get to decide what the result is, because whatever the type of the argument you pass to fold, that's going to be the type of result. And so now again, let's look at our sum example. So this is the same example as before, where I'm showing you both the, the running sum and the value that I'm adding. So you can see the first time fold is called, it receives as a result the thing I passed to it, which was 0. Let's change this. Let's say that I started my sum at 10 for some reason. Right, now I get the value 55, and the first argument to my fold function is 10. The second argument is always each item from the collection, but you'll notice here I start with 0. So I actually see every item in the collection one at a time. So reduce will always run one times fewer than the number of items in the collection because it initializes the result of the first item and it doesn't bother with that one. Fold will always run this, the same time as the number of items in the collection. Right, so here I'm basically doing a sum that's fine, but if I want to do something more complicated, um, like concatenate everything together, I can also do this. Right? So again, how I bootstrap this actually makes a big difference in terms of what I can do with it. Right? So now I am combining all these integers into a string. So I tell fold, start with the empty string. How do I combine two values? I take the previous result and I append value to it. If I wanted to do this backwards, I can do all sorts of cool things, right? So let's, what would happen if I do this? Oh, I need another dollar sign. There we go. That's pretty. There we go. Look at all this cool ASCII art we can make. Um, you know, if I do it this way, then it's going to be, I'll have it backwards. Right? You could use this to reverse a string if you wanted to. Right, so... The idea here is when I pass, the initial argument I pass to fold is an empty string. So that, that tells the function the type of result is string. And that also means that the type I get back from the operation is also going to be string. All right. And as you might expect, folding an empty list works out better than folding, well, it should work out better. Um, oh, I need to have a typo there. Yeah. So here... I can reduce an empty list because what I get back is just the whatever I passed to fold, my initial value. Right. If I passed like test, this would also, I would just get test out. All right, good. All right, last one in the, in the group here is filter. All right, so filter is very simple. Filter just returns a truth value that is used to determine whether or not the result will contain that element or not. Right? Filter has to return a boolean. Can't return anything else. So in the first example, I'm filtering the list to include only even values. In the second example, I'm filtering the list to include only values that are less than five. Right? But again, you know, that you may think this is really simple. This turns out to be a, a, a real key piece of the puzzle, right? Because there's a lot of times when you're working with data where you only want to look at a subset, right? And by filtering, you can identify exactly which data items you want to continue to work with, right? Um, filters, map, filter, reduce. Well, map and filter can, uh, can occur in your pipeline pretty much in any order. Reduce is trickier because it produces a single value. And so reduce doesn't result in a collection necessarily. Uh, map and filter both result in another collection. So those you can use interchangeably. So you can take a collection of data items, map it, filter it, map it again, um, you know, use these things sort of as building blocks to do more uh, sophisticated operations on, on collections. All right, any questions about, should have stopped after fold.
hold, filter, reduce. All right. To, and, and, and this is a, a, a completely incomplete list, um, but I wanted to point out that, uh, you know, one of the things that's nice about Kotlin is it comes with a bunch of these um, functions built in, right? A lot of these things are things that you can, you can implement using reduce or frequently reduce or fold, um, but a lot of them work sort of right out of the box, right? So you don't have to implement these. So some min max, right? All built right in and do what you think. Right. Um, here's kind of a fun example of implementing min using reduce. Right. So here, I don't need fold because I know that my value is going to be a value in the collection. So it's going to have the same type. Right. What do I do here? I get the previous minimum and the next value. If the value is smaller, I return that value. Otherwise, I return the previous minimum. Right. So this is very you know similar to how you would the logic you would see uh, when finding the minimum using a for loop, except it's just nicer uh, and, and a little, little cleaner. Distinct, um, something, and again, these are not, these are sort of ones that, I, that came, came to me off the top of my head, so maybe they're ones that I've used recently and I find kind of helpful. Uh, distinct gives you, uh, removes duplicate items. So you get back, and these are sort of compared using whatever the item defines as equality. Um, this one's a little bit more fun to implement, right? Um, so let me point this out about fold. Um, if you pass like a collection into your fold, you can modify the collection in each step. Right? So let's look at this example carefully. What am I doing here? So I've got a list of ints. The list has some duplicates in it. I'm calling fold. Right? Fold takes an initial value. The initial value I'm passing in is a mutable set. So Kotlin, we talked before, has maps, it has lists, it also has something called a set. What's the difference between a list and a set? Set doesn't contain repeated elements, but it also doesn't have a notion of order. order. Right, yeah. So a set either contains something or it doesn't. Because it either contains something or it doesn't, you can't put the same thing in twice. So it can't have repeated elements. Um, but it also doesn't have a notion of order, right? It's just something that you use to test whether or not uh, something is in there, right? Oh, I'm also, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, let's see here. Let me get rid of this also syntax. That's confusing. Um, so what am I doing? Let's, let's fill out the middle of this together. So this argument's going to receive whatever I pass to fold the first time. What I want to do is I want to add these elements in one at a time. So sets have an add operator. Okay. That will add the item to the set. It doesn't matter if it exists already. If it does, I'm cool. If it doesn't, the set now contains it. And then I want to return the set. Then with the result, I'm just converting it to a list. You don't have to do that. I'll just we could just print it. I think I think sets will print fine. Let's just print the set. There it is. Same thing. Yeah. So now here, does it make sense, everybody? I start with the set. Every step, I add the item to the set. When I'm done, I have a set. Because of the different because sets don't won't add duplicates, all the duplicates get removed. So again, you know, the reduce is a really powerful one of these uh, the pipeline primitives, right? There, and reduce and fold. There's a lot of different things you can do with them, okay? Um, sorted, another really pro popular thing, you know, uh, really common thing to do with data is to sort it. Um, if I call sorted, I get items sorted by whatever the natural sort order is for those items. If I want to adjust the sort order, I can use a, a function called sorted by. Sorted by is a higher order function that takes a function that's supposed to yield a key to use to do the sort, right? So in the first example, you can see I'm sorting a list of integers backwards because I'm multiplying each one by negative one. But this is a much, much, much more common use of sorted or sorted by. It's when I have data 
stored in some type of data class or in some type of object, and I want to sort it by one of the properties on that object. Right? So here I'm going to sort the people in my list by age. Uh, and I get this, this nice thing. Right? Um, reversed will reverse a collection. So you don't need to, you know, it's, you know, you don't need to do this, this weird thing here to sort things in reverse. Just sort them naturally and then reverse the order if that's what you're trying to accomplish. All right, uh, two more. There, and like I said, there are, there are a ton of these, right? Um, next week, we'll show you guys how to get started with IntelliJ in Kotlin, at which point um, you guys will have access to more of these because when you have a collection um, and you just kind of like get to the end of it and type dot, IntelliJ will very helpfully start to provide a bunch of these types of operations. And so that's probably the actually the best way to find out what's out there. Um, but here's again a an, an, an useful one that actually um, represents a pretty common pattern, right? This is not something that we couldn't implement ourselves using reduce, but it's super useful, okay? So group by. So I've got some data um, here. And let's say I want to group everybody in this data set by their age. Okay. So what group by returns is a map, mapping all the different ages to a list of all the people or the person objects in my initial list that have that age. Note that group by is not destructive. So if there's multiple people with the same age, they get added to a list. Right. So let's see what happens here if I run this. So when I run this on a, on a uh, list that doesn't have any duplicates, you'll see what I get out here is a map. The first key in my map is 40. That maps to a list that has one person and that's me. Second one is 38, et cetera. If I have duplicate ages, things get potentially more interesting, right? So now I've got, oh, sorry, okay. I did some other things here. Let me, let me put another print statement in there. All right, so here's the map that comes out of group by. 40 is one of the keys, but you'll see there are two people now in this list, and then zero has one person in it. And now I can find the maximum age of anybody. That's just the max key in my map. And I can print off all the people in this set that have the maximum age. So, you know, you, you probably can start to see some of the different data processing opportunities that these that these ideas open up, right? And yeah, you know, you could probably just like somehow figure out a way to plug all this into pandas and it would just magically happen or whatever. But like you guys are computer scientists, right? So this is, you know, this is a nicer way of doing things sometimes, right? All right, last one for the day, join to string, right? Um, and this is, you know, again, just one of these things that particularly when you're debugging, you know, and, and, and working with any textual data, you find yourself doing all the time, um, which is, taking things and converting them into strings and join to string is a nice way of doing that. It has some nice options. Let's see if I actually got the syntax right. No, I forgot. I forgot my data class. Let me just go grab it from the previous example. Um, there we go. Oh, and this is one of my <laughs> favorite things. So there's actually like a limit operator here. Um, you know, just like thank you know, because sometimes I have a lot of things. So I got to two and basically put a dot, dot, dot here because I had three items in the collection, but I told all of these play two. You can configure pretty much ex everything about how this looks, right? Um, all right, questions about whew, any of the stuff that we covered today? All right, so Here's, here's, let's do this for the, for the remainder of the time we have together. Um, let's implement map. We'll do a simple, a simple version of map, okay? Um, all right, let's see if I can actually do this. Um, so I'm gonna keep my main method here. I ask you guys to help me, all right. So, so what, we'll call this our map to distinguish it from the map that's built in. What, what should the signature of our map be? We can make this as limited as we want. For now, let's just have it like operate over lists or something like that, right? 
So what's the signature of our map? What are the two things I need to do in order to produce a map? What do I need? What's that? You have to have data and a Say that one more time. Like you have to have the list. Yep. Have yeah, so I need a list. Okay, and for now, we'll, we'll look at a more uh, a cuter way to do this in a sec. But for now, let's take a list as a first parameter. Um, and let's allow that list to contain any type of object. Right? Okay? And then I need a function, a mapping function. Right? Okay, so, so what, what's the, how do I define that? You can... You can sort of give me a sense of how to how to write this. So this, how many arguments does this? Well, I mean, so the, you know, let's just write kind of our skeleton here for a function argument. We'll call it method. What's the return type of method? Do we know? Let's just let it return anything. How many arguments does it receive? One. It gets the. Um, it gets each item in the collection one at a time. All right. All right. So let's just define this for now, and make sure that the compiler can deal with it. Okay. So, and then what's what's our mapping function going to return? Some sort of list. Yeah. And again, let's just allow it to have any any type, all right? So now it's going to be angry at me, uh, but we'll do return of any, just to get the compiler to stop. Okay, sweet. Okay, what do I do? I want it, let's let's be iterative here. The question is, do I want it to be recursive or iterative? Yeah, yeah. somebody's frightening me. Yeah. So inside our map our mapping function, we probably shouldn't call map, right? So we can probably it's probably okay to use a list here. Sorry, a loop. You know, we'll hide our loops away inside of our uh, inside of our higher inside of our higher order functions. So let's write a loop to go through all the elements in our list. Uh, let's do that first. Um, and then we'll just print it and see if this works, which it should. It's going to be slow. And now let's call our map with a list of integers. And let's for now, let's just provide an empty mapping function. And because we are, because we're using Kotlin, we have this trailing lambda syntax, and for now, let's just, we don't need to do anything here, but we'll just return, we'll just yield it. Just make sure that the, let's see here, what did I? Oh, let's do this. Well, you know what, let's just have this operate on ints for now. It's going to be a little bit of an, I have a limitation, but that's going to be okay. Um, just so we don't have to deal with the type. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Okay, and I think we can put this back to any. That work? Yeah, okay, great. Okay. So now I'm going through the elements in the original collection. What do I need to do? So now I've got... Why don't we start by just building a return collection with the same elements? So how, how would I do that? Yeah, let's let's just do it one at a time. Let's let's not copy the list. Let's do let's let's build a new list one at a time. How do I do that? Yeah. Yeah, let's create a new mutable list. We'll call this mapped list and we'll make it a val mapped list is equal to list and this needs to be a mutable list because we're going to add stuff to it it's initially empty 
and then we're going to return it here. And now let's say mapped list.add item. And so now this shouldn't produce any result, but let's print it. Or let's say mapped list is equal to our map and then print it down here. So yeah, okay, good. It's got the same items. All right, getting close. Now, what's the last thing I need to do? Yeah. Yeah, so I've got a method saved as a variable. And I know the item in the list, and I know what I want to put into the list is not the same item, but the result of calling method on it. Okay. Now let's see if this works. Look at that. Now, whether or not this is going to work, I'm not sure. Nope. Yeah. So now we actually have to tangle with the type system for a minute. So for now, I'm going to reduce <laughs> I'm going to reduce our map to only being able to Oh, right. I have to convert my mutable list my immutable list back into a um why is it mad at me? What's that? Oh, I think it's this guy. I think that'll work now. There you go. We will come back at some point when we talk about generics and Colin support for that, and we can make this actually fully general. Right? right now, we haven't talked about how to pass type parameters to our functions, and so we don't know how to do this. Uh, but this will work. This will support you know any any type of operations I want to perform, as long as what I'm passing is a list. Okay, last thing before we're done. How can we make this even more beautiful, even more joyful? We can use something that we saw last time to make this make me even happier. We talked about functions. One of the last things we talked about in Kotlin was this kind of really neat feature of the language. So I'd like this to look like the mapping function that Kotlin already provides. Right now, I've got to call this our map, and it's very clearly a function. I've got to pass a list to it, right? But how can I make this look more like Kotlin's map? So here's what I want, right? I want to be able to do this. I'll just write it, okay? I want to be able to do that. How can I accomplish this, David? Indeed, I will use the extension method capabilities. So. I, because I'm using Kotlin, I can add this as an extension method on a list of ints. Make sure this is actually going to work. Look at that. There you go. This is more or less. Again, there's, there's type issues with the type system that we're avoiding by specifying that this particular mapping function will only deal with ints. Um, but I think, well, let's see here. I think that we can actually deal with, I think we can deal with any. So let's try this. So now let's have this return a list of any. Um, I think that will be OK. Uh, oh, sorry, this needs to be any too. Okay. All right, and now I think we can do things like ah, there we go. Yeah, so we can deal with the we can deal with the type of the output being unclear, right? We can't right now figure out ways to operate uh, how to make this safe for different input types, but we will get there. Okay, any questions, David? Or is it doing 
I have no idea. That's a good question. It wouldn't surprise me if it looked a lot like this, right? I mean, you know, again, what, what's missing here are the, is the ability to make this more type safe. And if you guys remember back to 125, at the very end of, of that class, we talked about generics, which is a way to build uh, uh, classes in Java that can operate on different types. Kotlin also has generics, and Kotlin's generic support extends to functions. So I can make this function accept type parameters and then allow it to run in cases where, uh, and make sure that it's type safe, basically. We haven't talked about that yet, but, but I doubt that, um, I doubt, no, I suspect that the Kotlin one probably doesn't use a list, it probably uses some other data structure that's a little more efficient. But it's probably not that different. All right, so um, we, uh, partly be because Harsh has been really good at pestering me, so, the videos for the class will be online over the weekend. I will, I will commit to that. Um, we're working on getting a forum set up for you guys to use. Um, the homework problem system is coming along pretty well. Uh, I'm sure there will be great rejoicing once we release it. Um, and other than that, so on Wednesday, I think what we're going to do is, I think you guys have seen enough over two weeks to start to do some work in an IDE, and so I'll probably spend the hour on Wednesday um, kind of walking through the process of starting a project using IntelliJ um, and get you guys started doing a little sort of web backend type project using one of the Kotlin uh, tools for doing that, right? Uh, we'll also look at how to set up a sane development environment, which is something that very few of you know how to do. Um, and so we'll do that on Wednesday, and I will see you guys then. Have a great weekend.